we have talked about work for me. Um, we kind of went over our original property management deal right. where we kind of went through the general services and what we right. do. I think last month we talked about evictions. we talked about evictions. evictions yeah. I think there was something else we did. Wasn't there something else we talked about? Because I think this is the third or, or this is the fourth class. I think we've done if I'm not mistaken. No. <laughs> I missed two. I came last I missed a couple. I missed two. I went to the third one, and this is the fourth one, I believe. Right? You did the general services. Uh, you went over that. Over that. Oops. Okay. Well, it's all right. I know the computer doesn't want to connect here for the moment, so let's see if we can fix that. Why does this keep getting unplugged? It keeps unplugging me. Think that It'll make a difference. Okay. Well, anyway, well, we're struggling through. Let me reboot my computer and see if that's going to get us get us connected. Um, I think what we're going to discuss today is going to be um, the screening process, tenant screening. Okay. okay. Um, so while I'm waiting for my technology to get going, um, the application process mm -hmm. and all of the guidelines, as with everything, which is why I want to get the website up, are all on the website. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a tenant who is looking for, you know, what's it take to get qualified, yes. and, you know, what do I got to do, and yes. all the rest of that sort of stuff. For the most part, every question that they could potentially ask you is covered in our rental guidelines. Okay. You know, it's in its one page. It's very simple. It's written in plain English. Okay. Nothing super complicated about it. And it's just really a function of kind of getting them directed to the site and knowing what the, what the, um, what the terms are. So while I'm waiting for this to pull up, I'll just kind of give you the basics, okay? Um, first of all, the tenants need to have some sort of, by the way, this is going to sound very similar to qualifying a tenant to buy a house. And in many ways, it's the exact same type of criteria that you're going to have a lender is going to give you that we're going to apply to our tenant prospects. So hopefully get logged in and see if this thing's going to materialize. Um, So, anyway, it's going to be very similar. You have a lot of similarities between getting a buyer pre-qualified to buy a house and getting a tenant qualified to rent our house. Yes. So, what about yeah. a, a, a person that's going through the short sale thing or whatever, okay. and they want to go out and go rent and yep. their credit and? Well, it's right now again. We're in a we're in a much different marketplace. Right. We are renting. We are renting properties to former homeowners right. who have recently gone through a foreclosure yeah. and or short sale. Yeah. Um, but again, there is a certain amount of subjectivity to this. And this is where, this is where quite honestly, it, it, the property management side can be a little challenging because the rules, number one, we've got to be fair. We have to make sure if right. you had a foreclosure and you had a foreclosure, mm -hmm. we rented to you and we didn't rent to you. Yeah. There has to be other circumstances other than the foreclosure. Because mm -hmm. we can't say, sure, we just rented you one and we didn't rent to you one, because mm -hmm. then we have all sorts of discriminatory issues that mm -hmm. we've got to deal with. Mm -hmm. So it has to be more than just the foreclosure. Having said that, we are renting to people that have foreclosures. And we are renting to people that have had recent short sales. Mm -hmm. But one thing to keep in mind whenever we make these type of blanket statements, one of the things that we've talked about with, um, with the um, in the prior classes, is our individual homeowners mm -hmm. ultimately have the final say. So in other words, you're an owner and you're an owner. You and I talk. Martha, you're fine. You say, I'm okay. I'm going to go ahead and I'll rent to somebody who's had a foreclosure or whatever it happens to be. Um, as long as we have, they still have a job and they have income and they have other issues and they just kind of got caught up in this real estate market. Okay? So you've already given me a green light on that. You, for for whatever reason, have said, I do not want to rent to anybody who has had a foreclosure. As long as you consistently have that policy for your specific property that you own, we will follow that policy. Okay. Um, so it's and again, it's a little different, but it's basically the same. You will rent to somebody who has pets. You will not. Okay. So you, as the individual owner. Have, have maybe have a little bit different criteria. 
our internal criteria. If I'm rec if I if you if you tell me I will never rent to anybody who has had a foreclosure on their on the record, I probably would say you might want to reconsider that. Okay, because number one, that's a large pool of our tenants right now have got maybe mm -hmm. a ding on their credit or a foreclosure or even a short sale. Um, uh, and I would say that in the same way, sometimes you'll have owners that say, I never want to rent, I don't want to rent to any Section 8 tenants. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just as bad a policy mm -hmm. as the owner that says, I only want to rent to Section 8 tenants. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, renting to Section 8 tenants shouldn't be a blanket statement. I will rent to Section 8 tenants assuming certain criteria are met. Okay, I will rent to somebody who's had a recent foreclosure or a short sale as long as certain criteria are met. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pets thing, for example, I have to feel the same way about pets. A blanket statement is that I will never rent to anybody who has a pet. I don't know, I think it's kind of silly. Um, but sometimes homeowners have had bad experience with prior tenants mm -hmm. who have had pets will never do it again. Sometimes homeowners who have had bad experience with prior Section 8 tenants and they'll never do it again. So they get kind of set in their ways. So, but as long as they are consistent, and as long as we as a management company are consistently applying mm -hmm. that individual owner's wishes, assuming their wishes are not inconsistent with the law, I mean, if, if, if their wishes are, are, are discriminatory, then we can't do that. We just tell them point blank, we can't do that. So, okay, now I'm on, I'm on our website, and I've gone, let me jump back a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to the home page, and again, I want to make these buttons a little bit larger, but the, where you're going to find all the information on property management is under the property management tab. Mm -hmm. Okay, and again, I, I keep want to tell Ryan to punch these up a little bit. And I keep forgetting. If you hover the mouse over the property management tab, so far we've spent most of our information on the owner information mm -hmm. tab. We're now going to jump over to the tenant information tab. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, it's important to know what the guidelines are and how we deal with the tenants. Not because you guys are going to be working with tenants necessarily, but because the owners are going to have questions mm -hmm. as it relates to tenant screening. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to sign up a new property owner for our services, you, you need to have a general idea of what the guidelines are and how we qualify the tenants. Mm -hmm. So on the um, property management tenant information tab, first of all, you're going to find three big buttons here. First button is, this is where they can go to search our properties. Okay, we'll look at that at a later time. But if they click that button, that takes them to our, a separate website that is run by us, mm -hmm. and all of our rental properties are listed there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and again, the owners like to go here. Keep in mind, mm -hmm. we're wearing two hats. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're, we're putting our tenant hat on, but if you're going to sign up an owner for our services, trust me, they're going to come over here and they're going to want to see. They're going to come, well, let's just do it real quick. They're going to want to click on that button, they're going to want to see what properties we have available. Um, and are they nice properties? Are they competitive? How many properties do we have? What areas are we in? Mm -hmm. um, how does their property stack up with maybe another property that they see on the list? Mm -hmm. um, it, it is very simple. This, this goes actually to our back office software that controls our, that runs our property management side. Let me open this window up a little bit bigger so you can see it. And the original search that it's given us mm -hmm. is, this is everything that we have listed. Okay, so we've got a condo here on JFK, a house on Cataleo, house on Baylor in, in Hemet, uh, Meadow Breeze, Marina Valley. Um, now again, I'll just show you, I don't want to get to off topic too much, but let's just take two of these properties. Here's one on Miner's Trail. Um, and waiting for some pictures to show. I like this house. Whether I like the street on Miner's Trail is irrelevant mm -hmm. right now. It looks nice from the street, the grass is green, that mm -hmm. looks nice. Okay, um, owners tend to pay attention to that just a little bit. Um, now I'm just going to grab this one, just for another reason. I just noticed right off the bat, mm -hmm. this could look nice, mm -hmm. but we got a problem with the yard, and we probably need to get these bushes and trees trimmed back. It's important. It's the type of discussions that we want to have with our owners. Now, now maybe this property isn't quite as nice as it needs to be because the tenant just moved out and we have some other issues, or maybe. We signed up this owner, and this owner says, ah, just get it rented, then I'll fix the yard. Oops. Could be a problem. Okay. But at any rate, our owners and our tenants can go in here. I don't know how many properties we currently have on this list. I don't think it gives me a total at the bottom or not. I thought it gave us a total here somewhere. Um, it doesn't give us a total, but that looks like, I don't know, probably about 50. 
um, about 50 rentals or so right now. And we've got them all over. We've got you know, Marina Valley, here's a property in Claremont, Banny, Roma Land. Um, you know, anyway, we've got them all over. So, all right, so that's our search button. This is our application button. So I'm actually going to pull up, well, actually, before I pull up the app, I'll pull up the application first, and then we'll come, we'll come back to it. Now, there's two different ways that tenants can apply to our properties. They can apply online, which is exactly what it implies. You click the button, it brings up an online form, they start typing in the info. Type in there for their name, address, social, all the rest of sort of and they can do the entire application process online. Or, and this is what I'm going to do for our purposes, it's a little easier, they can click on the old-fashioned way, which is to download the paper application, mm -hmm. fill it out by hand, fax it in, email it, it whatever they want to do. Now you'll notice, right off the bat, we use the California Association of Realtors um, application fee or form. Okay, now this is really difficult to see, um, but this is basically their application that they're going to fill out to rent one of our properties. Very simple, only two pages long. Um, the first page, let me, it's a little bigger so you can see it. Basic information, who are you? First of all, what property am I, uh, am I interested in? Um, Am I a tenant? Am I a tenant with co-tenants? Am I a grantor or a co-signer? Generally speaking, we do not accept co-signers. Okay. Generally speaking, um, um, we want the occupants of the property to be the renter. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want mom and dad signing for the college student, for example. Mm -hmm. College student would be an occupant, not a signer. You know. Uh, um, or even a co-signer. We want the people living in the property to qualify. Does that create some problems maybe if we want to do a lot of housing over at RCC or Claremont for example. Mm -hmm. We manage properties over in Claremont. There's college, there's seven colleges over there. A lot of college students over there. It is more acceptable in that area to rent to college students. We don't do a lot of college student rentals mm -hmm. over here. And we don't do them for some of the obvious reasons. We've had some challenges, we've had some problems with that. But anyway, who's our tenant? Where's the property located? What's the name of the applicant? We require each applicant to fill out a separate application. Husband and wife, John, Sally, two separate applications. Okay. Anybody who's over 18 years of age fills out an application, even if it's an adult child living at home, or even if it's not really an adult. It's the it's the 18 year old kid who hasn't even graduated high school yet. Mm -hmm. You want them to fill out an application, Lance? Yes, we do. Okay. Now, we won't necessarily be qualifying the 18-year-old kid as part of the qualification guidelines. We're qualifying probably mom and dad in that particular case. But we still want an application. Why do we want an application on the 18-year-old? Well, number one, he's of legal age. Mm -hmm. Okay, And if, frankly, in the past, we've had mom and dad move into a property, legitimately move into a property with a teenage son. They stay there for several years. And then five years later, we don't even realize mom and dad moved out of the property four years ago and they left behind Johnny, who's now 22 or 23. Okay. So we want an application on all applicants over the age of 18, even if the applicant's grandma. Now again, there is some reasonableness to this. You know, if, they're, if, if grandma lives in the house, but you know, there's no income coming in, there's certainly no you know, there's no support being provided, and maybe grandma is just really, a, you know, on her last days kind of a thing. Okay, we we got to use common sense when it comes to that. We're not going to force a 95-year-old grandmother to fill out an application, but we certainly do want to know who's there. Okay, now if grandma is in her, you know, 60s or 70s, and she's kind of a, a spry young chick, and maybe she's even out working and she's doing her thing, I want an application on her. I want to know who, even if son and daughter-in-law are the ones that actually are the, are the true tenants. I want an application on ground. So do they all have to pay that fee? Correct. Everybody who fills out an application has to pay $35 application fee because mm -hmm. we're going to run their credit and we're going to check them out. Mm -hmm. And I'll use the son ex as an example and I'll use the grandma as an example. We want to see, and this may sound crazy, at first it may sound a little unreasonable, but we basically want to take a look at the credit. Okay. We want to see, and again, it may sound crazy, but we want to see if the 18-year-old son has been evicted. Or if we want to see if the 90-year-old grandmother has been evicted from somewhere. 
Um, you'd be amazed what people do. You will be amazed that parents will rent a property under their child's name. They'd be evicted. Parents will take out credit cards or car loans or other type of loans under their child's name. Okay? And I'm talking child's name. I'm talking 16-year-old kids, which in theory, how the heck are they doing that? Well, I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Now the kid's 18, and um, and, and the un totally rotten parents, if you, you ask my opinion, this poor kid hasn't even had an opportunity to establish credit, good or bad. They're now 18 years of age, that someone runs a credit report, and because they're loving parents, mm -hmm. have already destroyed their kid's credit. Guys, that happens all the time. So one of the reasons that I would want to run that application on that 18-year-old kid is, isn't even so much, because I'm not expecting, I'm ex what I am expecting is I'm expecting that 18-year-old kid's credit to come back as what we refer to as a ghost, yeah. okay? A ghost is somebody who has, there's nothing there. Yeah. And if you're 18 years old, for the most case, your credit report should be what? Nothing. Should be nothing, yeah. okay? As a matter of fact, us running their credit would probably, be, in many cases, be the very first time that their credit has ever been ran before. And we would want to see that on the application. If we run their credit and it comes back with a whole bunch of stuff, and it comes back with a whole bunch of inquiries, that's a signal. And it's frankly not so much a signal that the 18-year-old kid has got bad credit. It's probably a signal that we don't want to rent to the parents. Because how did this kid get a car loan for, he's 18 now, and he's had a car loan for two years, and um, he's been delinquent for two years, and he's had a repossession. Who, who got that car loan? Mom and dad. Mom and dad. Got it. So, anyhow. So, everybody gets an application. They get the same thing with grandma. We want to see if grandma's been evicted. Mm -hmm. We do not, by the way, I just said earlier, we'll rent to someone who's had a bankruptcy, or excuse me, a, an evict, mm -hmm. a foreclosure or a short sale. Mm -hmm. We do not rent to tenants that have been evicted. Ever. Okay? Mm. If you've had a bankruptcy, we'll work with you on a bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is a couple years old, maybe it's only even six months old. Mm -hmm. Kind of like with the foreclosure and the short sale, I'm going to take a look at the whole package. Take a look at the whole package of that tenant. Some people, and again, some owners say, I don't want to run to anybody who's had a bankruptcy. I would take a different approach to that. I would say, wait a minute, let's take a look at what's going on here. Okay? They, they, they recently had some challenges, an income loss, a, a health issue, a, you know, a divorce or something like that. But let's take a look at everything else. I'm talking bankruptcy right now. Let's take a look. They do have a decent job. Okay. And oh, look, look at this. They just lost their house to foreclosure. Couldn't afford it. And they got overhead, over their head on this, that, and the other thing. But they've got a good job. Now their bills used to be this, and now their bills are that. You take a look at the rest of the package and say, in some cases, a, a tenant who has filed bankruptcy may actually be an ideal tenant. Because once you file bankruptcy, the first thing you, in theory, would want to do is you want to try to reestablish. And you should be, and I would think in many cases, not that people don't file bankruptcy more than once, but it's a lot harder to do. But in many cases, those, those tenant prospects are trying to reestablish. And they want to make sure the rent's paid on time, and now they've got their bills down. So, um, you know, we do rent to people who have had bankruptcies, and sometimes recent bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. But again, that's a discussion that we have to have with the owner. So at any rate, they're going to fill out all their information. We need everything. We need their name, full name, middle names. We need their date of birth. We need that, obviously, because we're on the credit report. We've got to make sure Sally Smith is born on that date. That's what we're looking for. We need their social, driver's license number, state, phone numbers, emails, and all names of people proposed occupants. We want to know who's living in the house. Okay? So if this is just, you know, John Smith, and I got all my information in here, well, who's going to live in the house? Well, my wife's going to live in the house, and John, Johnny, who's 10, and Sally, who's 12, and, and, and you know, Mary, who's 8 months old. We want all of that. And Grandma, who's 94 years old. So we want to sit back and make sure we've got applications on everybody. We want to know um, what kind of car they drive. Not so much that we care. Oh, I skipped one. And pets. You're going to have a pet. What are you going to have? Dog, cat, fish. Is it a service animal? Can we say no service animals? No, we can't. 
if they've got a service dog, I don't care how, who's, who didn't want the dogs? Martha, well, you didn't want the dogs. Okay, I don't care. Norma, I don't care if you don't want dogs. This is a service dog. You're going to put a dog in that property. Assuming everything else for this tenant qualifies, that dog's going in. Uh, like what kind of car do we drive? We want to know. We're basically looking for a couple reasons. We want to see, does that car show up as a, something on the credit report? As a cash? We don't really care if it's a brand new car or an old car. We just you know, want to see what you got. In case of emergency, who do we contact? We contact Sally Smith, and here's her address. Does the applicant or proposed use to use this? I always said this, this is so outdated, this application. Do you propose or plan to use liquid filled furniture? What is liquid filled furniture? A water bed. It's a water, water bed. bed. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't even like made water beds anymore. They do. Um, they, well, I, do they? Do. It's been 22 years since yeah. I've slept on a water bed. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, now why do we want to know that? Water damage. Water damage, water insurance damage. purposes. We may say no, no water beds. All the bedrooms are upstairs, the water leaks, so, it goes downstairs, it destroys it. It's, you know, owners may say no water beds. Would renter's insurance cover that? It would, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. Okay. But it, it, well, it potentially would. I made a blanket statement like it okay. always does, but it, okay. it certainly could okay. um, cover that. Okay. Um, it's kind of funny. I, I don't know that we've, I don't know anybody. Just click the check the waterbed yes box on the final one. Has the um, applicant ever been party to an unlawful detainer action or bankruptcy within the last seven years? Unlawful detainer is an eviction. eviction. Yeah. Um, a bankruptcy audit. Now, again, this is another thing that's important. Let's, I said for a moment that under certain circumstances, we will rent to somebody with the bankruptcy, but we will not rent to somebody who's had an unlawful detainer. Mm -hmm. Well, let's suppose in this particular case they checked no, the no box. I've never been subject mm -hmm. to uh, an eviction or a bankruptcy. Then we run the credit and we see that they had a bankruptcy. For the most part, we will automatically deny them because mm -hmm. they lied on the application. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they had checked the box yes and said, yes, I had a bankruptcy six years ago, and we run the credit report and sure enough, there it is, it's, it's certainly possible that we would have approved them. Okay. Mm -hmm. But because they lied on the application, generally speaking, our rule is you lie on the application, you're out. So we're going to want to know if they've had an or, or if they've had a bankruptcy. Has the applicant or any proposed document ever been convicted or pleaded no contest to a felony? Mm -hmm. Ever been convicted of a felony? Okay. Ninety-nine percent of the times, the answer to that is no. We do get the occasional yes, and we want to know okay, well, what what is it? What what you do? You rob a bank. What'd you do? Um, now again, that's something. Well, again, let's put this in context. This is where this gets really fuzzy. Okay, and it's very approving these applicants can be very subjective. Let's suppose they said yes, and what did you do? I robbed a bank. Current job history is impeccable. Their credit is impeccable. Their prior tenants' reference is perfect. Everything is perfect, but they're a felon. So now I get to call Martha. This tenant's perfect. Got one little problem. They're, they're a prior felon. What do you want to do? Do you believe in second chances? Okay, now if you as the owner, and that's frankly exactly where we would put it. We, would, we as a property management company would not approve a felon without the owner's approval. And we put it on you. Okay, if you want to rent to the felon, then great. Then we will rent to the felon. If you don't, then we'll call Mr. Fallon up and say, well, we're very sorry. Your application looks really good. However, the owner of this particular property is not interested in rent to Fallon's. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, everything else on your application looks great. Let me see if one of my other owners might be interested in renting to a Fallon. So in, other, in other words, kind of what I'm saying is I like him as an applicant, mm -hmm. but we don't like that. Now, if they lie um, and say no, and then it pops up that they were a registered sex offender or something like that, mm -hmm. that's automatic. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's, let's deal with the registered sex offender deal. You have a tenant who applies and says, yes, I'm a registered sex offender. Okay, believe it or not, it, 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 this is getting to become scary, scary territory. Okay, there are actually um, um, some bills being presented in the legislature, which I'm overstating it a little bit, but it would basically provide Registered sex, which by the way, if you're a registered sex offender, you're a convicted felon. Mm -hmm. That's where this applies. Mm -hmm. okay? 
that would almost give them a protected class. So another mm -hmm. protected class is race, mm -hmm. religion, mm -hmm. origin, mm -hmm. sexual preference, familial status. Um, familial status. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I can't not rent to you because you're black. Mm -hmm. I can't not rent to you because you're Chinese. Mm -hmm. I cannot rent to you because you're gay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I, if if that's the, those are the cases, well, that's not a valid reason not mm -hmm. to rent to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, right now, and again, I'm hesitating because there's been a lot of discussion on this um, at the California Association of Realtors on how to handle this properly. Right now, if you are a convicted felon. Mm -hmm and your felony is your registered sex offender, I currently am comfortable saying, I'm sorry, we're not going to rent to you. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're a convicted felon. Really? Yeah, you're a registered sex offender. We're not going to rent to you. i got to tell you, there, like, there's legislation that actually would preclude a property management company from denying a tenant a residency because of that reason. Wow. And, and wow is my response as well because we have actually had registered sex offenders that we have actually rented to, mm -hmm. kind of snuck through. Mm -hmm. Or they um, moved into a property, you know, we rented Robin a house, and she's been there for three years, and then all of a sudden we get things from, which by the way, that happens. Mm -hmm. If you do rent, if we ultimately end up renting to somebody who is a, is a not necessarily a felon necessarily, but a registered sex offender, that's, people are very sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. You've got people in neighborhoods that are searching them. I don't know which one is worse. Well, I don't know. It depends on the crime, I suppose. Mm. Um, but you'll have people um, going to the Megan's Law mm -hmm. website mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't go there now, but you know, go to the Megan's Law website, mm -hmm. search their neighborhood, mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll, they'll do it once a month. Or maybe they see somebody new move into the property, um, and then they search it, and then, sh and then all of a sudden we start getting phone calls. We start getting letters at the property management company that says, hey, you guys, you Coldwell Banker Pioneer Real Estate, you just rented the house across the street from me to John Smith, registered sex offender, and here's his crimes. Mm, wow. Okay? Happens all the time. And then we get to call and say, wait a minute, who's, I call Robin up and say, Robin, who's John Smith? Oh, yeah, he wasn't, wasn't on the application, was never approved. Robin said, ah, oh, he's my brother. You know, he just got out of jail, whatever, needed a place to stay, he moved in. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Got to get rid of them. So at any rate, there, there's, there's a lot of nuances uh, um, to that. And as it relates to, again, I'm, I, we've been very, very, I, I can say this in all honesty, we've been very fortunate in that we have never had an applicant come to us and say, yes, I'm a felon and I'm a registered sex offender. Um, the day that happens, i got to tell you, I'm going to probably call the CAR legal hotline just to make sure something hasn't recently changed, because it would be very uncomfortable. Yeah, because I'm wondering, you're saying they're going to pass it, you can't just discriminate against them for that? Right. But isn't there a rule that if they're sexual, average as your sex offender, they cannot be within a certain distance of a park or schools? Mm -hmm. So you can turn them, so or would we be responsible well, to figure theory, out? Well, in theory, yeah, but that's really not how it ends up working, because the one, the one let me tell you the ones that we have, had, that we have experienced, mm -hmm. they've never applied. So I've never been faced with that, ooh, geez, if I deny am I going to get in mm -hmm. trouble? Okay. But where, the example I just gave where they were a family member and they ultimately, after the fact, moved into one of our rentals, that's happened at least 10 times that I'm aware of, at least 10 times. Mm -hmm. um, and and how, do we, how do we find out about it? We find out about it from the neighbors. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Neighbors, you know, and normally those neighbors get together. We don't hear about it from one neighbor, we hear about it from... 15 of the neighbors. Okay. And then they'll come to us and say, hey, this is the deal. And how, do, by the way, how did they know that? They went to the website. Mm -hmm. The term registered sex offenders, the term registered has meaning there. In theory, as part of their you know, release mm -hmm. conditions, mm -hmm. they have to register. Mm -hmm. I, Lance Martin, registered sex offender, live at 123 Main Street. Mm -hmm. That 123 Main Street shows up on the database. It's now got my picture, it's got pictures of my tattoos, it has my offense, mm -hmm. lewd and lascivious acts with a minor under mm -hmm. the age of 14 years old, all sorts of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. But all of that stuff, you could probably just cut that out in the video, so I'm just going to take this out of context. Um, <laughs> so, but at any rate, it's all on there. So now the neighbors see it. Okay. Now you gotta, to get to your question, 
Well, if the, I don't know what the rule is, but if the rule is you can't be so close to a school mm -hmm. or a you know, public mm -hmm. library or whatever it happens to be, well, I don't know who enforces that. I would assume that somebody up at the mm -hmm. parole board or whatever sits back and looks at a map and says, hey, you, Lance, you just said that you moved into 123 Main Street. They look at the map and they say, okay, you're good. You're in the good distance. You're mm -hmm. not too close to the school. So we certainly don't. So we don't have to be responsible for we, that? We certainly wouldn't be responsible okay. for that. But I tell you, in, in the cases, in all 10 cases, or however many it's been, where we have been notified, we've contacted the primary occupant, the tenant, and said, hey, Norma, it just came to our attention. Who's, who's, who's Sally Smith? By the way, I've never seen a female registered sex offender. Everyone I've ever seen has been, you know, a, a goofy-looking male white guy. Mm -hmm. Whatever weird thing. There's no black registered sex offenders. Yeah, yeah, there's some out there. Uh, there's, there's some of these white guys. I don't know. <laughs> like I'm telling you. Know, so at any rate, um, I probably just violated some law right there. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, um, we're, we just saw John Smith. Who is he? And then you tell me who he is. And I'm trying to help him out. You know, he's down and out. He's doing every place to stay. Well, he needs to find another place. And, and unfortunately, let's suppose you're a great tenant. And by the way, pretty much every time to my recollection where we've had this situation come up, the tenant that's actually the primary tenant in the property has been a good tenant. We've had a couple just break your heart where it's the parents. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, little Johnny. And, you know, the parents are in their 60s and little Johnny's 40. Mm -hmm. um, but um, he didn't have a place to go. And I'm like, gosh, I love you guys. You've been great tenants, but you've got to get rid of them because if you don't get rid of them, mm -hmm. you got to go. Mm -hmm. Break your heart. I remember we had one over at March Air Force Base years ago. Just, I mean, it just, they, the, te the parents were, you know, I don't know well, but they seemed like genuinely good people. They're just trying to help their son. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I don't remember what happened. I don't remember if he moved out or they all moved out. So at any rate, they're going to have to fill that out. And again, if they lie, automatic, done. Can't, um, we're not going to write to you if you lie. Um, has applicant, this is a very interesting one. Has the applicant or any proposed document ever been asked to move out of a residence? Not necessarily evicted, yes. but you've been asked to leave. Mm -hmm. I don't think in all of our years we've right. ever had anybody say so, yes to yeah, that. Yeah, was. But again, this is another thing when it comes to screening these tenants. And again, by the way, all these stories, I tell you, they're all real life stories. The tenant, of course, says no. Um, let's let Norman, you're going to be our tenant prospect. You're my guinea pig. So I call you. You put down your former landlord, which is down here. Where do I live? Okay. Well, I've lived at 123 Main Street. How long have I lived there? From here to here. Who's my landlord? My landlord is Martha. How do I get a hold of Martha? Here's her phone number. Um, so on and so forth. And so I call Martha. Martha, Lance Martin with Cobalt Banker Pioneer Real Estate. Um, we have an application from Norma, your, your tenant on Main Street, and your application looks good. We're just calling to verify her tenancy. When, what do we want to know? Did she pay her rent on time? Mm -hmm. Was she a good tenant? Was she difficult? Mm -hmm. you know. Let's just suppose for a moment that Norma is a tenant from hell. <laughs> right? But where is Norma living right now? There. In Martha's property. What does Martha want to happen? Her to leave. She yeah. wants her to leave. Yeah. So she's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It happens <laughs> all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Prior landlord verification, for the most part, is meaningless. Especially if the tenant still lives in the property. Okay? Because... Assuming you did give me the pro, which by the way, it also happens all the time. Mm -hmm. The you will put down that you live at 123 Main Street, which is truly your address, and you'll put down the owner's name is Sally Smith. And whose phone number do you give me? Your cousins. Your cousins, your sisters, <laughs> your brothers. You say, hey, expect a phone call, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Expect a phone call. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to be calling you. Make sure you get your story straight. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we do all the time is. If you apply and you say you live at 123 Main Street and Robin is the owner, is we'll, it just takes 30 seconds. We'll go up and we'll verify who's the owner of 123 Main Street. Mm -hmm. Who's the owner of 123 Main Street? Oh, Martha's. Wait, Martha, Robin. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what's going on? So, now sometimes your story's legit and, you know, Martha and Robin are co owners and on the prelim and only showed Martha, Robin was below that. I mean, it happens all the time. But normally that's not the case. Normally we have someone who's lying to us. That happens all the time, but again, verifying the prior occupancy is um, 
frankly, is one of the, the least important factors because the landlords lie. They lie all the time to get them out of the property. Now, if you're already been, now let's say a previous landlord, who did you rent from before? Mm -hmm. Okay, now you're already out of that house, but do you give me, you've had a terror, you know that Martha hates you. You know that Martha came this close to evicting you and it was a big disaster and so on and so forth. Are you going to give me Martha's name and phone number? Mm -mm. Probably not. And if you did, I would call. Now, Martha, now, in this case, Martha would be happy to say. But sometimes, maybe not, because everybody's afraid of getting sued, right? Mm -hmm. I don't say anything bad. <laughs> and other owners, you know, they'll, they'll be, you know, I, I'm, frankly, I'm fairly open when it comes to this stuff. Sometimes borderline may be a little too open. Um, but um, you got to be careful. Getting, getting verifications from, from landlords, <coughs> not so great. Employment history, again, this is a little Same good. problem. It can be the same problem. <laughs> But again, you got to be careful. Okay, now where do I work? I work at Cobalt Bank or Pioneer Real Estate. How long have I been there? Yada, 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 yada. Um, has anybody ever had a relative apply for a job and they called you and said, hey, I just put you down as a reference? Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, I worked for you. Mm -hmm. And you own ABC Plumbing. And I've been there for three years and mm -hmm. I make X amount of bucks. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever had a relative do that? I've had yeah. employees do that. Yeah. Well, I, I have, I have had not so much employees, Tell me but I have had money. you know <laughs> friends slash family members of mine on a regular basis mm -hmm. call me and say, "Hey, would it be okay? Somebody's going to call you." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably shouldn't do that. So Ryan's comment is right. This can be just as big of a challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when they're bigger companies, not so much, because obviously, if we say that if they say they worked at um, the United States Post Office, okay, this is the address, this is what I make, we're going to want paycheck stubs, we're going to want, now can you doctor up a paycheck stub? Oh, yeah. Of course you can, very easily to do, but if they're working for larger, you know, for, for lack of a better word, legitimate companies, mm -hmm. um, a little bit more difficult for the tenant to do that. Not that they couldn't change their income, but you know, when you know when you call the U.S. Postal Service, you're probably going to talk to someone in HR and you're going to get the proper verification. Most big companies, as a matter of policy, will only verify that they, A, they worked there, yeah. and right. B, if they're eligible for rehire, nothing right. else. Sure. Right. And, and frankly, most of them won't talk to you over the telephone. Right. We're going to, well, there's a couple other forms we're going to show where we actually want written verification mm -hmm. um, from the employer, and frankly, that didn't really come from us. That came from the employers. A lot of the employers said, no, I'm not going to talk to you. I don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. You say you're calling from me. I don't know. So we basically send a, an employment verification that's been signed by, similar to a mortgage verification, mm -hmm. or, or landlord, like the tenant, a buyer is applying to get a mortgage. One of the things that the new lender will do is say, I want a verification of rent, which is done in writing, and a verification of employment, which is done in writing, and a verification of funds, which is done in writing. The buyer signed and says, you're my former landlord. You're authorized to release my information to Wells Fargo. You're my former, or you're my current employer. You're authorized to release my information to Wells Fargo. You're my bank. You're authorized to release my bank balance to mm -hmm. Wells Fargo. Okay, Those are all done. We do the exact same thing. Those are mailed in to the banks, or uh, for the most part, we don't mail them because when you're doing a loan, that's why it takes 30 days, 45 days to get loans approved. They're mailing these things and they have to wait for them to come back. Mm -hmm. Our tenants aren't willing to wait two or three weeks to get approved. They want to get approved in a couple of days. So in our cases, we're, we're, we're faxing or emailing in these verifications and hoping that the, the bank and the former um, or the current employer verify and send it back. But we want to know, like what Brian said, and a lot of times they won't verify, but you'd be surprised how many people will. Bigger companies, big HR companies, they're paranoid. Someone's going to sue them for privacy violations and all the rest of that. Smaller companies can be a little bit more forgiving. Mm -hmm. But again, it's always it's always a catch. It can always be a problem. And frankly, a lot of so much of these applications, it really is common sense. I mean, if, if it makes sense, most of the time it does make sense. Um, if it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay, then we want to know. And again, this, by the way, this, this is pretty much it. I mean, there's not a lot of information here. Who's your credit? Do you have a credit card? Where do you bank? And we basically just want to see if they put down, yeah, I've got a loan with Ford for my 2008 you know, Explorer. And, you know, here's my number and here's my name. We're not really concerned, to be honest. We're not really concerned about the account number. People get hesitant get a little leery about that. We just want to see, does that match up with what your credit report says? Why does your credit report say you have five cars? 
Okay, or why does your credit report say you have no cars? Mm -hmm. no. So we're going to take a look at that. Um, personal references, do they mean anything? Mm -mm. Junk. <laughs> mean nothing. <laughs> Who are you going to put down on your application that's going to say something bad about you? Okay. In theory, and the same thing with relatives, in theory, one of the main reasons we want to put this down, assuming we get any good information, is if, if after the fact we're looking for you. Now, someone will, surely once you want to pull one over on me, you'll put down your sister, and you'll put down a phone number and an address, and you, but you call your sister, hey, make sure you say nice things about them. We're not even going to call your sister. No, we're not, we generally don't spend a lot of time verifying this because we get, we get bad information. It's a skip thing. But... Now you've skipped out on us. We just evicted you. We can't find you. Or something's happened. We'll definitely go back to this and we'll call your sister. Say, hey, Sally, this is Lance called the Bank for Pioneer. We're looking for your sister. Can you help us out? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, depending upon the nature of the call, we may not necessarily handle it that way. Maybe you've skipped out on us. Maybe you so. skipped out on your sister's loan, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, but at any rate, that's really what we're looking for. And that, that's really the end of the application. And that, that, that's pretty much it. They sign here. Um, here's our application fees. So I mean, we just spent you know 30 minutes going over this, but let's let's just really summarize in, in 10 seconds. Who are you? Have you ever been convicted of anything? Have you ever been evicted? Um, where have you lived? Where do you work? That's about it. Not a whole heck of a lot there. Pretty pretty straightforward. So now that we've looked at the actual app. Uh, by the way, there's a couple guys or a couple videos on here. Um, Tiffany's on here talking about something, um, and actually Christina, who's mm -hmm. here, she doesn't work here anymore, but she's kind of you know, introducing her to the, to the world. Um, down here, this is the guidelines. This is kind of what we talked about in the beginning of the meeting. This is, these are the questions you'll get from tenants, and these are the questions that you're going to need to know when talking to a um, when talking to a landlord. They're going to want to know this. Okay, let me scroll back up and see what our okay, qualification guidelines. All applicants must complete the entire application. The entire application. Mm -hmm. If you don't submit the prior landlord, we don't process it. If you don't submit the employment, we don't process it. Okay, we're not going to we're not going to do it in piecemeal. Um, they got to submit it to us. Um, prior to Coldwell Banker Pioneer Real Estate processing the application, including all phone numbers, account, I, I just said we don't really look at the account numbers, but it says we want them. Prior landlord contact information. Please, please inform prior landlords and employees that your office will be contacting them to verify information off our data. Applications with prior evictions or judgments will not be acceptable. Okay, if you've been evicted, we're done with you. Now we've thrown judgments in here. We. For the most part, I think people are looking at and seeing, they're thinking eviction judgment hand in hand. But judgment is actually a completely separate deal. Do we accept tenants who have had judgments? Yeah. But it depends on what we're looking at. You know, I have a judgment against me. I've been sued in small claims court dozens of times on property management related stuff. I, I'm, I'm sad to report recently, and it's probably, I can count the number of times I've lost on two or three fingers, but recently, I lost a small claims judgment um, in small small claims. They sued me personally, which they shouldn't have. It's a whole other story. So I paid that off, but I frankly I need to run my credit to see whether or not that tenant ever went and filed that judgment against me. I got a judgment, twelve hundred bucks. Sucks. Affects my credit. In this particular case, I'm an, 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 an unacceptable tenant. So there there is a little bit of a of a variance as it relates to judgments. Now, if you're filled with judgments all over the place. Uh, the, the example I've used previously, you run a credit report and... But it's just active judgments, unsatisfied um, judgments. Well, not necessarily. I mean, we've got, again it, it, again, it really depends on what we're talking. Keep in mind, an eviction is a judgment. Yeah. Okay? There is a judgment for possession. Okay? You have been evicted from that property. You have been adjudicated and you are judged to be evicted. So, but we get, we get judged. These are the ones that drive me crazy all the time. And these will be mostly show up on the collection accounts. A little different deal than a judgment. Judgment means we've kind of gone to court and all the rest of that. But we've I've seen credit applications with judgments for silly small amounts. Mm -hmm. You know, two hundred dollars for an unpaid phone bill. Mm -hmm. You know, you know who will go after you if you if you bounce a check on them? 
is the Pizza Hut delivery people. <laughs> you bounce a check for 45 bucks for the buffalo wings and two large pizzas. It'll ruin your life. <laughs> they, they're hardcore. Uh -huh. I cannot tell you how many credit reports I have seen. And, and the first, I mean, I've been looking at these for 20 years. I'm like, what the heck is that? Pizza Hut for 48 bucks. Wow. You know, well, delivery, they bounced a check on the delivery guy. We don't rent to those people. And frankly, we also don't rent to people, if you have collection accounts from AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, mm -hmm. and you basically go from one cell company to the next cell company, the next cell company, the next cell company, because, you know, they keep shutting you off and, you know, probably not going to rent to you. Probably not going to rent to you. If you can't pay your cell phone bill, we're probably not going to deal with that. Okay. Um, Applicants currently in eviction will not be accepted. Believe it or not, we do have people that come to us periodically that are currently in eviction um, and they want to apply for us. This is another thing that gets back to your presentation. When you're presenting to a landlord um, and they, maybe they've been a for rent by owner for a little while mm -hmm. and we're advertising in our normal fashion and they're doing their for rent by owner in the newspaper and Craigslist and all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. Where do the bad tenants go? They go to the firm by owner. Because they know if they come to a professional property management company, mm -hmm. we're going to run their credit. They can't come to us. They can't come to ABC professional property management companies. We're going to check all that out. But this drives me crazy. We'll have, I'll have owners. Maybe, I've, maybe we've got your property. It's vacant. You're on our service, and we're trying to get you rented. 30 days go by, and, and for whatever reason, we haven't been able to get your property rented. There's something, something it's probably priced too much, right? So an owner, you, so well, I'm going to go run my own ad. So you run an ad in the paper, and then you run it on Friday, and you call me Monday morning. Lance, your property management company must not be doing something right, because I just ran an ad in the newspaper, and I had 45 people call me, and boy, do they sound good. <laughs> <laughs> and I screwed. And I said, well, uh, well, I can guarantee you, they won't call me, because there's probably, not in every case, I mean, some of them obviously are going to be good tenants. Um, but where do the poor tenants go? They go to the for rent by owners because it's my, they, this for rent by owners can be easily bamboozled. You wash your car that day, you put on a nice clean shirt, and you, you go in there with a load of cash first month and last month, and then you pay your rent and you move in and then you, you don't pay. Okay, so here's our guidelines. Oh, and also applicants with gross income must be two and a half times the amount of the rent. If I have a $1,000 a month rental, the applicant has to make at least $2,500. We actually lowered that probably about a year ago. We used to have it three times. In order to qualify for a $1,000 a month rental, you had to make $3,000. We've kicked that down a little bit to $2,500. And I've heard that uh, some property management people they want everyone in the house over 18 years old to Qualified. earn that too. Yes. Uh -huh. um, if, they're, if they're not, and you, that's true, we allow, comp, we allow husband and wife to combine. Okay. Okay? So I make 1200 bucks. my wife makes you know, 1500 bucks. they make 2700 bucks. We qualify for a $1,000 a month round. Um, we do not allow, you know, two brothers to combine. Mm or a, 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 a lady and her girlfriend, or whatever it happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, girl, I don't mean girlfriend, girlfriend, I mean, because again, then we got, we've got some mm -hmm. familiar issues there, you know, mm -hmm. sexual orientation, if they're, if they're domestic partners, mm -hmm. that's okay, okay? Mm -hmm. But if, that, if that's not the relationship, then we don't allow them to combine. Sometimes you individually you have to qualify. Uh, that brother, you know, he came to live with us yeah. or whatever. Now I've got to make it known that he's there and he has to qualify two and a half times for the rent. That would be correct. Let's assume he doesn't have other issues. Let's, let's mm -hmm. assume he, he just needs a place to stay. No we don't have any, we don't have any yeah. felonies or anything like that yeah. to worry about. If he moves in, we, first of all, if you're, if you're doing the right thing and you're calling us and saying, hey Lance, my brother needs to come stay with us. He's going to move in permanently. So, so I want to get an application on him. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see what his income guidelines are. Okay. Okay. In theory, we want him to qualify. Because if we're worried you move out, we Can left him behind. Well, way. we certainly won't put him on the lease unless we qualify him. As okay. we, put, we could put him down as an occupant. Okay. But we certainly wouldn't put him down on the lease if he doesn't qualify. Because it's easier to get him out. 
Okay. Okay, so here's the basic thing we're going to do. This is what we need, okay? We need recent paycheck stubs. We want at least a month. We prefer more, but give me at least a month of your current paycheck stubs. I want to verify, you know, does it look right? We need a copy of your social security card. We don't want the number, we actually want the card. Now, can they be fraudulently produced? I guess. I mean, I don't know where to get one, but I suppose Crooks they're do. easily available <laughs> to get. But we still want a copy of the card. We take a photograph, of, you know, take a copy of it, name, phone number, whole nine yards. Um, we want a copy of their current driver's license or some sort of identification card. We want to see, again, can those be fraudulently produced? Of course they can. Mm -hmm. We want to have that. Um, if they're self-employed, real estate agents or some sort of salesperson or whatever, we want a copy of tax returns. Give us two years copy because they're not going to have necessarily a regular paycheck stuff. Right. So give us the tax returns that show that you actually made the money that you say you made. Mm -hmm. What's your income? Um, oops. Um, we want we want additional information about may be requested to clarify certain things. So depending upon what you give us, we may need some additional stuff. If you filed bankruptcy in the last seven years, we want to copy the bankruptcy papers. Mm -hmm. We want to just make sure that you know that you did get everything discharged. By the way, the bankruptcies of course show up on the credit report, so that's where we're going to see that. Um, each adult applicant is required to pay a non-refundable credit report processing fee of thirty-five bucks. And again, adult defined as anybody over eighteen. This, this fee applies to spouses, adult children, and or roommates. Anybody who's applying that's over 18 has to fill out the application and the credit report. All roommate applicants must be able to meet the qualification, kind of gets to what you were saying, must be able to meet the qualification guidelines individually. Mm -hmm. Married couples may combine. Pioneer Real Estate does not accept cash or personal check. All payments credit processing and future rents must be paid by cashier's check or money order only or via our online payment system. We don't accept cash for some obvious reasons. We manage hundreds mm -hmm. of properties. Mm -hmm. It's the first of the month. Tenants are, the average rent is 11, 12, we have $2,000 a month rentals. We have 100 tenants coming in paying cash in their rent. We all have more money than Wells Fargo in our mm -hmm. lobby. We could have a couple hundred thousand dollars in cash in our lobby if we accept the cash. We don't accept cash. Um, we don't accept personal checks for the obvious reasons. Personal checks tend to bounce on occasion, so we don't want that. So we only accept cashier's check or money order, or frankly what we're trying to get our, most of our tenants to do right now is to pay on the online system. Mm -hmm. You pay online, you set it up, just like anything else, pay your bill automatically on the first of the month or whatever day you want to be paid. Um, which, by the way, that's pretty much it on, on our, on our guidelines. This is, this is what we need, okay? Not that much. Okay, you're going to give us this information along with your application. Um, once you're accepted, property, all of our properties are leased for a year. Security deposits are normally one month's rent plus $200. Okay, so if we have a $1,000 a month rental, the deposit would be twelve hundred. If we have a two thousand dollar a month rental, the deposit would be twenty two hundred. Okay. Um, if the property um, owner accepts pets, there's a two hundred fifty dollar pet deposit fee per pet. Okay. By the way, it's a good idea that they're honest on their application up front. Do they have pets and how many? We get this all the time. They lie about the pets. We don't deal with them. They get them approved, and at the very end, they show up. Oh, I forgot to tell you about Fido. Ugh. <laughs> well, let me go back and see if the owner will accept FIDO. Oh, and then by the way, how many FIDOs you got? Well, I got three of them. Well, I need another 750 bucks, 250 per month. Is there a monthly for the pet? No, no monthly. Okay. No monthly. Um, I kind of, I've always kind of had a problem with this one, but it is what it is. We don't accept pit bulls. We don't accept Rottweilers. Um, and, and to be honest with you, whether you love pit bulls and Rottweilers, really has nothing to do with it. This is insurance purposes. Most insurance policies. Have some sort of an exclusion mm -hmm. for "quote unquote" vicious dogs. And we can debate whether mm -hmm. pit bulls, all pit bulls, and all Rottweilers are vicious. I would say they're probably not. Um, but at any rate, our insurance carrier says don't mess around with it. Um, there is a minimum non-refundable holding deposit equal to one month's rent on any home for the applicant. So uh, you're now approved. Today is the 11th. You want to move in on the 15th or you want to move in on August 1st. I don't care what it is. 
you're going to your that's a fifteen hundred dollar a month rental you will give us a cashier's check for fifteen hundred dollars to hold that property it doesn't matter whether i'm holding it for three days or two or three weeks which by the way we don't normally hold properties off the market for more than a couple three weeks max mm -hmm. so if you were approved today but you didn't want to move in until october we're not going to hold that property for two and a half months off the market you're going to, you're going to have to start paying that now the deposit is non-refundable three days later said so i don't want it anymore you just lost 1500 bucks well that's not fair you only held it off the market for three days you're right we only held it off the market for three days but during that three days the perfect tenant other than you called our office and said hey is one two three main street available and we said no and we just let now we know what do you mean they perfect well, i don't i can't say for sure that the perfect tenant called but it's possible that the perfect tenant called while you were on while you tied us up and we lost it same type of thing with the real estate transaction that's why we have liquidated damages we have earnest money deposits um, and it's not so much to, to argue as what did the tenant or the, were they really damaged? They really lose fifteen hundred bucks. Well, you don't really know how much they lost, because maybe we lost a great buyer. We lost the great tenant. Maybe maybe the property stayed vacant for an extra week and now it's been vandalized. So at any rate, the deposits, the whole deposits are non-refundable. All deposits are required to be in office within twenty-four hours of notification that the application has been approved. If we approve you on Tuesday and you don't show up with a deposit, we're gonna we're not gonna take the property off the market till we have that deposit. Which, which begs the fact, or begs the question. You, you, you have an application on 123 Main Street. This is very similar to like, getting offers on, on real estate, on listings, okay? You give us an application, we approve it. But we also have three other applications. We don't have the whole deposit from you yet. And now it's the next day's coming. We say, hey, Norma, we can't get a hold of you, can't get a hold of you. Well, Robin has submitted an application that comes in, and now we're, now we're looking at Robin's application, and we're like, Wow, Robin's application is so much better than the one we just approved for home. Call the owner up. Hey, I know we just approved one on Tuesday, but they haven't brought in their deposit. They haven't held it. We got a better app. You're approved. We call you up and say, sorry, you're out. What do you mean you're out? You just approved me two days ago. I know, you bring down your deposit. We found someone better. That's not fair, I came in first. You should have brought in your deposit. Got to bring in your deposit, 24 hours. Again, same type of thing with, with, with an offer. You know, until, until those contracts are signed and formally accepted, another offer could come in and what's better, you're out, kicking you out. Always makes for fun conversations. Um, holding deposits holding deposits are applied towards, towards the movement costs. So again, $1,500 a month rental. Norma does bring us in her $1,500 hold deposit. She's going to move in in three days. Um, she owes an additional $1,700, which would be the security deposit. So total mm -hmm. movement on that property would be $3,200. $1,500 rent, $1,500 deposit, plus a $200 cleaning deposit, $3,200. So if you give us $1,500 as a whole deposit, before you move in, you bring us another $1,700. All the monies are applied. Um, depo and deposits cannot be transferred from one. This, this, this becomes a problem for us a lot. This, this, this happens quite often. Um, my battery's going to die. Hold on just a second here. Tenants trying to transfer deposits, and it kind of it's almost understandable, but it, it creates it really creates some heartburn for us. Um, okay, let's again let's pick up Norma. Norma has gone to our website, has searched our properties, and she goes here and she sees a list of 50 properties: on Main Street, South Street, XYZ Street, and Norma picks. Picks one. She picks Firebrand. Oh, this is a perfect example. You get approved for Firebrand. Before you move in, you just happen to be cruising back. Eh, you're going to show your friends some pictures of Firebrand. So you go back to our website, you pull on, hey, this is the house I'm going to move into on Saturday. And then right below Firebrand, you see JFK for the same dollar amount, and you start looking at pictures of that, and you say, <laughs> call the office. 
I was just on your website and I saw this property on JFK. Blah, blah, blah. Is it available? And you, they say, yes. And then you say, great, thank you. And you transfer me over to Tiffany or to Aubrey. And you say, hey, guess what? Um, I don't want Firebrand anymore. I'm moving to JFK. I like it better. It's closer to my job, closer to school. 100 bucks cheaper. Now, it almost kind of makes sense because they're on the website. These are all managed by us. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all our properties, right? Mm -hmm. So like, what's the big deal? Well, they are all managed by us, but they are not our properties. This is owned by Sally Smith, and this is owned by John Jones, two different owners. We now have an agreement and a contract with Sally Smith, not with John Jones. Now, is John Jones going to be happy that you just switched? Mm -hmm. Is Sally Smith? No. Uh, it's a problem. It's very different than a lot of tenants, especially if they come from an apartment building. If you go to an apartment building and you get an approved on an application and say, hey, we're going to put you in Unit 10, and then you know, three days before, you say, you know what, I, I see that Unit 15 is available. It's the mm -hmm. same unit. Does, does, does the landlord care? No. They don't, they don't care. In there. It's your, their building. It's all one owner. We're going to move into 15, move into 11. I don't care. We do care. It creates a big problem. And i got to tell you, this happens, this happens more often than I'd like it to admit. And it's, it's a problem. And frankly, I think we need to do a better job as, as a company to emphasize the... Um, this line of the guidelines that, in effect, say you, you can't transfer, you can't transfer your security deposit from property A to property B, or your hold deposit from property A to property B. And then, lastly, on here, it just talks about deposits have to be made, cashier's check, or money order. Again, we do not take cash or a personal check for hold deposits because they just they tend to bounce. Okay, a couple other things, and we're almost done. I'll answer, open up for questions. Um, now, we've got our guidelines, okay, so here it is. We've got um, renting with us, the process. Um, let's see what this is. Oh, this is our tenant package. You guys should, I'm not going to go through this, but you should put this, <coughs> this should be part of your presentation to the owners. This is a 21-page PDF which basically goes through the whole process of running a property through this. What do we do? Rental agreement, who's the party, terms of your lease, how we do late fees, how do you pay us, um, what your deposit's all about, condition of the property, where to park your cars, who takes care of the landscaping, who can live in the house, can you have dogs, what are the rules and regs, should you have insurance, renter's insurance, how's the maintenance working, what you're responsible for, can you repaint the house or put a room addition on, um, do we have addendums, um, who pays for the electricity? How do you get a hold of us in case of an emergency? Okay, so that again, this is something that you you can provide to the owners of the property as part of your presentation. This is a thorough process, and again, you may be thinking, Lance, why do I need to know all of this tenant process? Because all I want to do is go sign up the owners. You're never going to have to do anything that I just described to you, but the owners will ask you. They are going to ask you these questions, and if you can't answer them properly, they're probably not going to sign the property up with you because they're going to figure you don't know what you're doing. Here is our application to rent. We already looked at that. Here is our rental qualifications. This is what we just looked at. The first one we looked at was um, actually on the website as one of our pages. This is a same exact information. It's just on a PDF form that the tenant can print out if they want. Exactly the same thing that we just went, went over. Um, the online payment sign up. If the tenant's interested in signing up for online payments, which we encourage, this is where they can sign up to um, fill out their information to get their payments taken out of their bank electronically. Um, tenant information letter. What do we got going here? Um, we got nothing going here. Let's try that one more time. Tenant information letter. Okay. Um, actually, you know, we looked at this last time. This is, this basically is an additional format. This describes to them how to do the online payment, which is the second for the first form we just pulled up. Utility account information form. We give this to the tenants prior to them moving into our property. The tenants have to have the utilities turned on, and they have to have them turned on in their name, and they have to oops, give us the account numbers. So before they move in, 
we want to know, hey, who did you, you're with elect the SoCal Edison, and here's your account number, and Eastern Municipal, here's your account number, and SoCal Gas, here's your account number, and you've called the waste management, here's your account number. Why do we want to know that they've done that? Because we want to make sure they're paying for the utilities. Right, not a bit. Tenants move in. One of two things happens. Both of them are bad. A tenant moves into a property, they have not turned on their utilities. If we've done our job, what happens? Utilities get shut off because the utilities are on in the owner's name while the property is vacant. So then what happens? The tenant calls us up. They're upset. Ah, and it happens, of course, on a weekend. And it's 112 degrees and the kid has asthma and it's a medical mm -hmm. emergency. And it's our fault because they don't have electric. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you should have turned on the power. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. And nobody ever claims responsibility for it. At least they don't take responsibility. It's our fault. That's not the type of conversation I want to take on a 4th of July weekend. Okay? Or, what's even worse, tenant moves in, they don't transfer the utilities, and then we, in our, in our system, we have a breakdown, and for some reason the utilities don't get turned off in a timely fashion. Now the tenant is getting what? Free utilities. Free, yes. The bill comes in. Who wants to pay that bill? <laughs> the owner's certainly not going to pay it. They shouldn't pay it. Wait a minute. Why am I paying August bill? They moved in July 20th. Why am I paying this? You know. So then, of course, what do we do with it? We send it to the tenant and say, hey, you a little bit of a misunderstanding here. You didn't get your utilities on, and now you used 30 days of, of electric and water and gas on me. Here's the bill. Would you please pay them? What do they do? Oh, did I do that? No, I don't want to pay them. <laughs> I don't know why I'm not paying them. So then what do we got to do? We got to take it out of the security deposit. Oh, God. It's just a mess. So anyway, we want the tenants to pay their security deposit in advance. Okay, there's... there's um, a couple other forms I'm looking for, and I don't see them, and I, oh, maybe they are, nope, they're not here. Um, we do have, and I, I need to get with Brian and, and the property manager to have these added. Um, we do have those forms we discussed earlier. This is the, it's the authorization mm -hmm. form. The mm -hmm. tenant signs the authorization for us to um, check their employer, or their authorization to check their um, banking account information. Mm -hmm. Those are not on here. And then lastly is, um, a copy of a sample lease. Okay. I think you this, went that. this is yeah. I'm not going to go through it right yeah. now. But this is the lease that we would use um, for the tenant, and when they sign. So we, we certainly encourage the tenant, and it's a CAR form, just like right. everything we use. They're all California Association of Realtors forms. Right. This is the six-page lease that we use to sign the form or, or to sign the lease. So we encourage them um, again to put this in the context, kind of a real estate deal. You guys are writing an offer on a Fannie Mae property, and what does Fannie Mae want you to do? They want you to take a look at their addendum, just right. in case your offer gets accepted. Download this addendum, take a look at it, have your buyer initial it just so we know that they've seen it. Okay? We like our tenants to kind of do the same thing, because normally when do they see the lease for the first time? They've already filled out their application, yeah. they've something? already been approved, yeah. we've already done the walkthrough, yeah. they're going to move in tomorrow, yeah. they come in tonight, they That's sign the lease, lease, and then all of a sudden they're like, what's paragraph three all about? Mm -hmm. It's the very first time they've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. Okay, So we really encourage them to, hey, go take a look at it. Understand okay. that you know we've talked about all of these things, but we might not have gone into complete depth, for example. Um, where's insurance at? Um, yeah, I used to have this thing memorized at the back of my hand. Hey, there's a paragraph in here that talks about insurance, page 4, paragraph 33, okay? And it basically says, hey, you should get some insurance, renter's insurance. Because if the house burns and you don't get it, the house burns down, we're not going to buy you new furniture, we're not going to relocate you, we're not going to do anything. Sometimes that's a big surprise to they freak out over it. And so, we, don't, we don't make that a requirement? You actually you can't. Um, at least the way I talk, the way it sounds wrong to me. To be honest with you, I probably should go triple check. Um, but the way it's always been described to me is, I cannot force you to buy renter's insurance if, as a contingency of approving your application. Um, and that's that has been our rule. We do not force our tenants to buy it. But when we fill out the lease, we stop at page four, paragraph thirty-three, and say, "Hey, renter's insurance is cheap." I mean, for a couple hundred bucks a month, right? I mean, it's 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 good. It's as good as a homeowner's insurance policy. Okay, house burns down, the tenant lost their television, their furniture, their clothes, their dishes, all that sort of stuff. Thousands of dollars worth of their jewelry, 
Yeah. If they don't have renter's insurance, the homeowner's insurance that mm -hmm. the owner has, right. no coverage for that. No. The tenant now has to be relocated. Um, the only thing that will do, today's the 11th of the month, you paid your July rent, your house burned down last night, mm -hmm. we'll give you approximately 20 days of rent back. Okay. We're not going to put you up at the, you know, how quick, are you going to be able to move into a house that quickly? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Mm -hmm. If you have renter's insurance, they'll put you up with a residence in, two bedroom suite for two, three weeks, a month, mm -hmm. until you find another house. Mm -hmm. They'll cut you a check for all your lost clothes and jewelry and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's more expensive to live out of a hotel than it is out of your house. They normally will give you $150, $100 a day food allowance because now you've got to eat at McDonald's as opposed to cooking your own food or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. So it's cheap. Yeah. Honestly, if I really, if I answered, I don't know the answer to be honest with you, but if I had to guess, I would say probably less than 10% of our current tenants have renter's insurance. Right. Okay, I'll take a couple of questions and then we've got to clear this room out. because the owners are going to have questions mm -hmm. as it relates to tenant screening. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to sign up a new property owner for our services, you, you need to have a general idea of what the guidelines are and how we qualify the tenants. Mm -hmm. So on the um, property management tenant information tab, first of all, you're going to find three big buttons here. First button is, this is where they can go to search our properties. Okay, we'll look at that at a later time. But if they click that button, that takes them to our, a separate website that is run by us, mm -hmm. and all of our rental properties are listed there. Mm -hmm. Okay, And again, the owners like to go here. Keep in mind, mm -hmm. we're wearing two hats. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're, we're putting our tenant hat on, but if you're going to sign up an owner for our services, trust me, they're going to come over here and they're going to want to see. They're going to come over, let's just do it real quick. They're going to want to click on that button. They're going to want to see what properties we have available. Um, and are they nice properties? Are they competitive? How many properties do we have? What areas are we in? Mm -hmm. um, how does their property stack up with maybe another property that they see on the list? Mm -hmm. um, it, it is very simple. This, this goes actually to our back office software that controls our, that runs our property management side. Let me open this window up a little bit bigger so you can see it. And the original search that it's given us mm -hmm. is, this is everything that we have listed. Okay, so we've got a condo here. And, on JFK, a house on Cataleo, house on Baylor in, in Hemet, uh, Meadow Breeze, Marina Valley. Um, now again, I'll just show you, I don't want to get to off topic too much, but let's just take two of these properties. Here's one on Miner's Trail. Um, and waiting for some pictures to show. I like this house. Whether I like the street on Miner's Trail is irrelevant mm -hmm. right now. It looks nice from the street, the grass is green, that mm -hmm. looks nice. Same way, sometimes you'll have owners that say, I never want to rent, I don't want to rent to any Section 8 tenants. Mm -hmm. like, that's, that's just as bad a policy mm -hmm. as the owner that says, I only want to rent to Section 8 tenants. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, renting to Section 8 tenants shouldn't be a blanket statement. Mm -hmm. I will rent to Section 8 tenants assuming certain criteria are met. Okay, I will rent to somebody who's had a recent foreclosure or a short sale as long as certain criteria are met. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pets thing, for example, I have to feel the same way about pets. A blanket statement is that I will never rent to anybody who has a pet. I don't know, I think it's kind of silly. Um, but sometimes homeowners have had bad experience with prior tenants who have had pets and will never do it again. Sometimes homeowners who have had bad experience with prior Section 8 tenants and they'll never do it again. So they get kind of set in their ways. So, but as long as they are consistent, and as long as we as a management company are consistently applying that individual owner's wishes, assuming their wishes are not inconsistent with the law. I mean, if, if, if their wishes are, are, are discriminatory, then we can't do that. We just tell them point blank, we can't do that. So, okay, now I'm on, I'm on our website, and I've gone, let me jump back a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to the home page, and again, I want to make these buttons a little bit larger, but the, where you're going to find all the information on property management is under the property management tab, mm -hmm. okay? And again, I, I keep, want to tell Ryan to punch these up a little bit, I keep forgetting. If you hover the mouse over the property management tab, so far we've spent most of our information on the owner information mm -hmm. tab. We're now going to jump over to the tenant information tab. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, it's important to know what the guidelines are and how we deal with the tenants, not because you guys are going to be working with tenants necessarily, 
at foreclosure. Because mm -hmm. we can't say, sure, we just rented you one and we didn't rent to you one, because mm -hmm. then we have all sorts of discriminatory issues that mm -hmm. we've got to deal with. Mm -hmm. So it has to be more than just the foreclosure. Having said that, we are running to people that have foreclosures. And we are running to people that have recent short sales. Mm -hmm. But one thing to keep in mind whenever we make these type of blanket statements, one of the things that we've talked about with um, with the um, in the prior classes is our individual homeowners mm -hmm. ultimately have the final say. So in other words, you're an owner and you're an owner. You and I talk. Martha, you're fine. You say, I'm okay. I'm going to go ahead and I'll rent to somebody who's had a foreclosure or whatever it happens to be. Um, as long as we have, they still have a job and they have income and they have other issues and they just kind of got caught up in this real estate market. Okay? So you've already given me a green light on that. You, for, for whatever reason, have said, I do not want to rent to anybody who has had a foreclosure. As long as you consistently have that policy for your specific property that you own, we will follow that policy. Okay? Um, so it's, and again, it's a little different, but it's basically the same. You will rent to somebody who has pets. You will not. Okay? So you, as the individual owner, have, have maybe had a little bit different criteria. Our internal criteria, if I'm rec if I if you if you tell me I will never rent to anybody who is at a foreclosure on their on the record, I probably would say you might want to reconsider that. Okay? Because number one, that's a large pool of our tenants right now have got maybe mm -hmm. a, a ding on their credit or a foreclosure or even a short sale. Um, um, and I would say that the same language. Um, it's in its one page, it's very simple, it's written in plain English, okay. nothing super complicated about it. And it's just really a function of kind of getting them directed to the site and knowing what the, what the, um, what the terms are. So while I'm waiting for this to pull up, I'll just kind of give you the basics, okay? Um, first of all, the tenants need to have some sort of, by the way, this is going to sound very similar to qualifying a tenant to buy a house. And in many ways, it's the exact same type of criteria that you're going to have a lender is going to give you that we're going to apply to our tenant prospects. So, hopefully get logged in and see if this thing's going to materialize. Um, So, and anyway, it's going to be very similar. We have a lot of similarities between getting a buyer pre-qualified to buy a house and getting a tenant qualified to rent our house. Now, so, what about yeah. a, a, a person that's going through the short sale thing or whatever, okay. and they want to go out and go rent and yep. their credit and? Well, it's right now again. We're in a we're in a much different marketplace. Right. We are renting. We are renting properties to former homeowners right. who have recently gone through a foreclosure yeah. and or a short sale. Yeah. Um, but again, there is a certain amount of subjectivity to this. And this is where, this is where quite honestly, it, it, the property management side can be a little challenging because the rules, number one, we've got to be fair. We have to make sure if right. you had a foreclosure and you had a foreclosure mm -hmm. and we rented to you and we didn't rent to you, yeah. there has to be other circumstances other than the We have talked about. Work for me. Um, we kind of went over our original property management deal, right. where we kind of went through the general services and what we right. do. I think last month we talked about. Evictions. We talked about evictions. evictions yeah. I think there was something else we did. Wasn't there something else we talked about? Because I think this is the third, or, or this is the fourth class. I think we've done, if I'm not mistaken. No. <laughs> I missed two. I came last. I missed a couple. Is, I missed two. I went to the third one, and this is the fourth one, I believe. Right? You did the general services. Uh, you went over that. Over that. Oops. Something. Okay. Well. Sorry. My computer doesn't want to connect here for the moment. So let's see if we can fix that. Why does this keep getting unplugged? It keeps unplugging me. Think that It'll make a difference. Okay. Well, anyway, well, we're struggling through. Let me reboot my computer and see if that's going to get us get us connected. 
Um, I think what we're going to discuss today is going to be um, the screening process, tenant screening. Okay. Um, so while I'm waiting for my technology to get going, um, the application process and all of the guidelines, as with everything, which is why I want to get the website up, are all on the website. Okay. So if you've got a tenant who is looking for, you know, what's it take to get qualified, yes. and you know, what do I got to do, and yes. all the rest of that sort of stuff. For the most part, every question that they could potentially ask you is covered in our rental 